Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. The small cafe in the center of town was quite crowded at that hour. Molly and Cindy struggled to find two free seats in a remote corner and ordered a set lunch. Cindy winked and to her friend, can you start? There's no time to waste, spill it out. What's the trouble you're in? Molly looked apprehensively at the man who sat next to her and inspiredly sipped his soup. Her glance was interpreted by him as a desire to talk, and he remarked cheerfully, My job is stressful, and I always have a voracious appetite when I'm stressed. But the soup here is good. It neutralizes any stress. As if in confirmation of these words, the man once again began to bend the seated one with relish. On the contrary, Cindy jumped with laughter in the palm of her hand. She looked meaningfully at her friend and sighed in a unique language that the friends had used since their school days. This meant that the conversation would have to be postponed until the soup lover had finished his meal. In the meantime, the man quickly finished the first course and started the salad. His proximity was beginning to weigh on Molly, and she thought hopefully that the eating would not be accompanied by unpleasant sounds. But she realized she'd made a mistake in her predictions when her neighbor pulled up a plate of fresh coleslaw. Now there was more crunch added to the tea. The situation clearly amused Cindy and Molly looked at her belittlingly, but she waved her hands. Mole, bear with it, friend. There are no vacant seats in this place. Indeed, all the tables were occupied, and as soon as a seat was vacated, it was immediately occupied by someone else. Cindy, after a brief pause, cast another fleeting glance in Molly's direction. Relax, they're bringing our order now. The young waitress cleared the trays with a magician's dexterity and wished them a pleasant appetite. The neighbor had finished his lunch and was finishing his compote. Let's put the glass aside. He reluctantly got up from the table. Thank you for the pleasant company, but the trumpet is calling me. Cindy gave him a long look and Molly said cheerfully, we seem to be alone. Use the moment to say what your emergency is. But no sooner had Molly opened her mouth then the seat vacated next to her was taken by another votive visitor. The elderly man tactfully asked, I'm not shy of you. The woman smiled strainedly. No, not at all. Enjoy your meal. The man cheerfully answered you too. The soup here is extraordinary. That's why I'm a longtime fan of this place. Molly thought with annoyance another soup lover. This cafe must be a gathering place for fans of this dish. Cindy could hardly contain herself from laughing. There were worms dancing in her eyes. She whispered quietly to Molly, not all is lost, eat in peace. We'll talk afterward. Molly had an urgent matter to attend to, or rather, a delicate request for her friend. And when she asked Cindy to meet, she hadn't planned to spend money or time on lunch. But the friend stated Molly, no offense, but my time is split second by second. That's why I'm trying to make the best of it. I suggest we discuss your problem on our lunch hour. Let's meet later. Since Molly acted as a petitioner, she had to agree to her friend's terms. She came to the cafe, which had a positive reputation in the office environment of the city and waited for her friend. Cindy appeared just a couple of minutes later, but the hall of the institution was already completely full. It remained only to submit to circumstances. What the women did by mutual consent, when they left the cafe, Cindy looked defiantly at her watch. We still have about 10 minutes left. You can make your wishes known in that time. Her friend looked down at her a little and arrogance was clearly evident in her tone. Molly realized that a friendly conversation was not going to work. She was ready to abandon her intention to ask her friend for help. But Cindy knew her too well. She gave Molly a friendly hug. Don't take offense at the way things are turning out. But you know, you have to keep yourself up all the time to stay afloat. You wouldn't believe it, but because of the wild workload, Andrew and I don't have time to exchange a word, let alone more personal matters. We're a mess with this one. Molly realized that Cindy was going to start telling her about her misfortunes and run out of time. She unceremoniously interrupted her friend. Cindy, I'm sorry, but you said yourself that you don't have much time. I understand how hard it is for you to not be intimate with your husband, but I hope you're listening to me. Apparently, her friend hadn't expected such an abrupt turn of events. 
The smile slipped from her well-groomed face. Madam, and she threw it down unhappily. Well, I'm listening to you. And Molly intuitively felt that she was about to receive a rejection, but it was too late to back out. Cindy, you probably know that William in the hospital on the face of the interlocutor instantly appeared, suffering Sheck expression. Oh yes, that's all my clientele talks about. After all, your husband is a famous man in our town. He's taught so many young people. I sincerely sympathize with you and I'm ready to help as much as I can. Molly interrupted. That's what I hope. You see, William and I have all our money in circulation. I mean, before he got sick, he invested it in some promising project. And now he's in need of a pretty hefty sum for treatment. But as far as I know, the doctor's prognosis is not good. Cindy hugged her friend again. Molly, I understand your desire to help your husband. But is it worth throwing money away? The blasphemous words of her friend caused Molly a second shock. She looked at Cindy in amazement and couldn't believe that she could compare the cost of treating a man to an unjustified sacrifice. Cindy, how can you say that? What if, God forbid, an accident happens to your Andrew? Molly, I'm asking you not to be so hard on the psyche. You can't know what you're going to do in any given situation. That's why it's better not to fill your head with bad thoughts. Feeling that Cindy is about to jump beautifully to another topic again, Molly asked, don't avoid answering, Cindy. Tell me straight out, will you give me money? The owner of the small store she had bought not without their help. He glared angrily. No, I won't. I don't allocate funds for a hopeless case. There's no guarantee that the treatment will help William. I don't want my money to be used by fraudsters. No offense, but I don't believe in unproven treatments. No matter how much they advertise them on TV, Molly felt like her whole world was crumbling before her eyes. She mumbled a little. Cindy, there's no need for explanations. I've got it all figured out. Molly turned abruptly and headed for the bus stop. Cindy shouted after her. Molly, why did you run right away? Let's think about what we can do together. Molly turned around. Are you late for work? Ten minutes is already over. Cindy threw angrily in the background. You need money. So sell your car or your apartment, it's as simple as that. Or do you feel sorry for your own good? Tears ran down her cheeks and bitter resentment overflowed her heart. Molly did not expect that her best friend, with whom they had gone through fire and water together, would refuse her. She thought with despair how quickly you forgot all the good things William and I had done for you. You used to be a nobody with no name. And now she's acting all tough. You're an ungrateful pig after that. Molly said all this to her friend, mentally hoping for some temporary relief. But it became even more bitter, and she cried again. Who else to fall at her feet? The woman began to mentally go through her friends and acquaintances. But after the first failure, her resolve faded. She tried to calm herself down. She needed to cool down and think things over. If Cindy had said no so flatly, others might do the same. Something inside her ached and resented her friend again. But the eye beckoned. I never thought I'd gotten a blow from my best friend. A man passing by looked at her in surprise, and Molly realized she had spoken her thoughts about her friend out loud. To calm down, the woman closed her eyes and took a few deep breaths. This technique was taught to her by her daughter Nancy. As a child, she was interested in theater arts and later enrolled in the University of Culture. She claimed that breathing exercises helped to put her daughter's nerves in order. The method helped to calm her down a bit. Molly boarded a bus that was headed to the regional hospital, where her husband was currently undergoing treatment. But as the woman did not try to tune into the positive wave, the unpleasant conversation with Cindy wouldn't get out of her head. For as long as Molly could remember, Cindy had always been there for her. Their mothers had worked in a candy store for many years. The women were good friends, and their daughters went to the same day care center. Cindy immediately took on the role of leader, which delighted her mom. That's right, daughter. Let everyone know who they're dealing with. Sometimes it's good to be cheeky if it helps the cause. Molly's mom disagreed with her friend. Will your Cindy bossy attitude get you in trouble someday? Kids don't like upstarts like that, and they can get them in trouble. Well, Lena and her mother liked her daughter's activity. 
and she even encouraged her daughter's desire to elbow her way in. And chutzpah she considered one of the best qualities. Without chutzpah, you can't get anywhere today. If aunts and math, you can't get anywhere in life. But the woman's mom, as in water, her prediction came true. When the girls were in the fifth grade, they noticed that Cindy Grain of Sand is always running to the teacher's room. So they decided to teach her a lesson for snitching. Only one Molly decided to stand up for her friend, but she received a portion of slaps from her classmates. After this educational action, Cindy a little tempered his ardor, but soon everything returned to the former course. However, the classmates no longer engaged in violence, but began to ignore Cindy completely. Molly, too, fell under the press of contempt, and so it went on until graduation. And then the paths of friends diverged. Molly went to college. Cindy, with her diploma, had to go to college. Their friendship was rekindled after Molly's wedding, or rather, during the preparations for the event. Shortly before the party, Cindy called out of the blue. Can I congratulate you? I heard that you are getting married? Molly did not expect this call, so from confusion answered uncertainly. Yes, I'm getting married soon, and I don't have a minute to spare. I see, what do you need a friend for now? It was said in such a tone that Molly felt ashamed for some reason. She tried to justify herself. Cindy, I lost track of you. You stopped calling me. You could have checked with my mother. I'm sorry, it didn't occur to me. Cindy laughed in her inimitable way. I'll only forgive you if I'm your maid of honor. Although Molly had already chosen a fellow student as her maid of honor, she gave in to Cindy. However, she didn't regret it once, because her friend did an excellent job. True, even during the celebration, Cindy as if casually hinted that she had problems with employment, slyly squinting into her eyes. She said if you get a job, we'll be even. You know like it'll be payment for my services. William didn't like Cindy's snoring then. Yeah, well your girlfriend is, let's face it, not the shy type. To be honest, I didn't expect her to give us such a deal just for going to our wedding. Molly was ashamed of her friend, but she didn't want to say no. And she looked at her husband William with a belittling look. Not everyone is up to your standards. But Olya and I have been friends for so many years. You don't have to go on. I'll try to do what I can for your girlfriend. Molly's husband helped Olya get a job in the college cafeteria, but the girl worked for only six months, after which she resolutely declared no, that's not a job for me. It's not really my thing. I would have agreed to wash dishes as an apprenticeship master. Let him look for other fools. Molly remembers William's surprise at the time. He tried to tell her friend that to be a foreman you had to have the right education. The man even advised her Cindy, enroll as a part-time student and then things will be easier to solve. But that's a suggestion. She's a willful girl. I'm not gonna mess around. I'm a man without an institution. Are you going to be jealous of me? For almost five years, she stayed out of sight. Once Molly decided to visit her friend's mother, but from the neighbors learned that she sold the apartment and left. So the left-handed woman shared her suspicions with her. I can't say for sure, but I think Cindy's in the middle of another story. The apartment was sold in a hurry. The news had Molly worried sick. After all, the fate of her friend was not indifferent to her. Since Cindy did not answer the phone, Molly began to look for her. She remembered how once her friend told her about some relatives in the village and went there. What she saw in that remote place shocked her. Cindy and her mother were huddled in some chicky barn and her friend looked like a frightened animal. She was genuinely excited at her arrival and cried for a long time on Molly's shoulder. Molly, thank you for not forgetting. I thought you and I would never meet again. You know I'm being hunted. That's why I can't show my face in town. I could get killed. Molly started shaking her friend. Tell me what you've done again. When the crime of remorse passed, she told me how she decided to become a businesswoman. There was no money. So the young adventuress borrowed a small sum from a man with whom she had an affair at the time. But love quickly ended, and the beau began to demand the return of the debt. She had to sell her car, apartment, and atelier. He took it too. He gave it to me first and then took it away. Molly was shocked by the encounter and told her husband everything. Even though they already had two children at the time, 
William sighed and said friends need help. I'll think of something to save your girlfriend, Molly doesn't know to this day what measures William took at that time. But soon Cindy reported that her ex-boyfriend had unhooked everything from her. Molly, you're not gonna believe this. He gave me a little extra money. Said he miscalculated the interest. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough to put me in a good business. Molly asked Eulia, maybe we shouldn't go down the same road. The friend in her peculiar manner replied Volkov, fear not to go into the forest. I'll be more discreet this time. Cindy rented a small room and turned the space into an atelier for minor clothing repair. Surprisingly, this direction turned out to be profitable and brought, albeit small, but stable income. Two years later, Cindy decided to buy a small store, but she again lacked money. The couple gave her the necessary amount without reservations, and William showed the breadth of his noble soul. Will you give it to me when you get a chance? You can take your time. And Cindy took her time. For almost 10 years she had been paying back her debt drop by drop, and each time during the procedure of handing over the money, she regretfully said that it was so easy to borrow, so hard to pay back. It is a pity that it is impossible to cancel the debt because of the statute of limitations. As in criminal practice, such applications had always embarrassed Molly, but she had tactfully kept silent. Only now she had experienced firsthand what good things are worth. Even family and friends are not always paid back in the same coin. Molly had heard many times the common expression that trouble comes when you don't expect it. For a long time this phrase for her represented a set of words, its meaning. She first realized it when her father had a stroke. That Sunday afternoon changed the rest of her life. Summer was counting her last days. And they went to the farm as a family to harvest the crops and prepare to build a new house. The plot was allotted to her father for his merits and labor, and her parents treasured these poor bulletins as if their lives depended on this piece of land. Starting in the spring, they spent all their free time on their farm. The work was finished in the fall. Although a wooden structure of 10 square meters with an area of 10 square meters with a stretch fit this definition of a house. Her mother and father were very proud of the property and Molly laughed at their affection. The wind would blow it away one day. Leo had a healthy sense of humor and did not take offense to his daughter's criticism that our farm was undersized. It's no big deal. Here I will go on a well-deserved vacation and a grove a cottage in two floors. Mother also dreamed of turning the crooked, perky barn into something decent, so that it would not be ashamed in front of the neighbors. But she did not want to wait until her husband retired. So at the height of the farming season, she's always itching for Leo. Look at the beauty people have turned their plots into. Our house is a doghouse. It'll do for the season. You're not gonna move here, are you? Anything's possible. If we get water, heat, we could live here in the winter. Maybe Molly will get married and move to the farm. For a long time, the man fought off his wife's attacks, but one day he couldn't take it anymore. What is it with you women and your brainwashing? Do you know how much it will cost us for your house with amenities? Nina with a smile answered the surprise not to be pampered. Not the last piece of bread we finish eating. I'm not asking you to start building right now. We can gradually move towards the goal. First buy materials, then bring water. Leo reluctantly accepted his wife's plan. They couldn't wait to start building. That Sunday afternoon they were to bring blocks, so the mother hurried her daughter and husband. Or else people will come, and the owners are not there. The work schedule is like this. My father and I will carry the blocks. And you, my daughter, will take care of the towns and I will get married. I have not been attracted to farming since childhood and she didn't take her mother's call with optimism. Mom, let's switch places. You'll go to the garden, and I'll help Daddy. This division of labor was fine with everyone. When they arrived at the place, Molly went to the neighbors and asked them for a wheelbarrow. The case immediately went Molly threatened the vehicle, and her father took the apples to the barn. The work was already coming to an end when Leo suddenly fell down near the loaded wheelbarrow. Molly thought at first that he had just tripped and rushed over to him. Dad, why are you being so sloppy? But her father didn't answer. He was lying there unmoving. With his eyes wide open, only his lips moved. But it was impossible to make out the words. Only the daughter could be heard clearly. 
Call your mom. It took 40 minutes for the ambulance to reach the village. By that time, Leo had already lost consciousness. As it later turned out, the man's condition worsened because the women tried to drag him into the house. The ambulance paramedic was very rude about it. Why are you bothering him? Don't you know that you can't move a person in such situations? Nina was still in a state of shock and responded inappropriately. How would we know? We're not doctors. He fell and that's it. We couldn't leave him lying on the cold ground. The mother wept bitterly. Molly said bitterly to the medic. You could have come earlier. They wanted to get into the car to accompany the father to the hospital. But apparently the paramedic took offense and slammed the door of the loaf in their faces. We're not a cab to take everyone around on demand. Only late in the evening mother and daughter hitchhiked to the city and went straight to the hospital. There they learned that the father was in critical condition. The doctor sadly said if you had immediately taken the patient to the hospital, the prognosis would be more favorable. And now we can only hope for a miracle. Of course, the miracle did not happen, but that time the doctor still managed to snatch Leo from the clutches of death. But after the stroke he remained an invalid, deprived of the ability to serve himself independently. Nina was no longer interested in the plot and the house. She made a lot of efforts to make life easier. His wife Molly was already studying at the institute at that time, but she always came home on weekends. It was only after six months that Leo slowly began to recover. His speech returned. He began to move around a little on his own and even made jokes. Nina rejoiced at his progress. Molly, it seems to have passed. Trouble is upon us. And your father is already smiling around the house with a stick, helping me. God willing, he'll be running soon. But the heavens did not hear the pleas of the woman who could not imagine life without her beloved husband. Two years later, there was a second stroke, after which Leo did not recover. After the death of her husband, Nina became withdrawn. She did not leave the apartment for weeks and lost all interest in the cottage garden. Molly used different ways to get her mother out of the state. But all her attempts failed. Even the grandchildren could not bring the woman back to life. Nina could sit for hours without moving, staring at the picture of her husband. Molly watched her mother and thought God forbid to experience such grief. But the young woman did not know what a heavy test prepared for her fate. Nina outlived her husband by eight years. She went into the next world, quietly, in her sleep. The doctors diagnosed her with heart failure. And it really surprised Molly, because mom never complained about her heart. They didn't even have Valadol in their home medicine cabinet. It was the second blow from which Molly could not recover for several years during this difficult period, helped her to persevere. Husband William took over some of the household responsibilities. He took care of the children and organized healthy recreation on weekends. The old ladies on the bench at the driveway were always discussing their family. Such a positive man William today, it is rare to meet a man of such kindness. He is a reliable support in his family and helps other people's children to get out into the world. The second elderly lady completed the list of merits of her neighbor. An acquaintance of mine who works at the college told me that William is very well respected at the college, and parents often turn to him when their kids get discouraged. There was not an ounce of exaggeration in these admiring comments. William truly valued family above all else, and his work came second. But he treated other people's children the same way he treated his own. If any of his relatives or acquaintances commented on the matter, he would say, There are no other people's children. And I am happy that the state entrusted me to bring up the young generation. After all, they are our future. Although this statement sounded pompous, the teacher spoke sincerely. He believed in his mission. Of course, William treated his own children more reverently. When Thomas and Nancy were small, he did not consider it a shame to change slogans or cook porridge for the children. Nancy was especially attached to her father. In early childhood, she called him mother. At first, the couple thought that the girl just confused in the words, but Nancy was ahead of her peers in development. And when Molly told her daughter that there is a mom and dad, the girl with enviable stubbornness began to prove. There are mommy, our daddy, better than you cook's porridge. He takes me to daycare and reads me fairy tales. 
therefore he is a mom. Molly understood the reason for the new term and laughed for a long time. In the evening she told her husband about her little daughter's reasoning, and William even wept from the feelings overflowing his manly heart. He brought the girl to his powerful chest and kissed her. Thank you, Nancy. I think that's a very apt nickname for a super daddy. If his daughter could make ropes out of him, the elder Belsky's relationship with his son was purely masculine. His father fostered a sense of responsibility in Thomas from the time he was a baby. He often repeated when the boy was going to develop, Tema, real man never cries. If you shed tears, guys will despise you and girls will not be friends with you. This warning worked without fail, and Thomas tried to be like his father in every way. But in addition to the best human qualities, William tried from an early age to instill in his son a love of sports. In the past, he himself seriously engaged in weightlifting and tried to keep his body in good physical shape, although Molly was not a fan of sports activities. But she did not want to lag behind her husband and children. And in the winter, they often went skiing with the whole family out of town, where there was a campground with all the necessary infrastructure. Such trips to nature not only strengthened immunity, but gave a lot of colorful emotions. When Nancy grew up a little, she began to take a camera with her. I will make a chronicle of our glorious family. And without photos, it is difficult to create something substantial. Nancy's ideas later caught on with the rest of the family, which contributed to the creation of a rich archive. Molly's greatest fear was that her universal happiness would be suddenly cut short. This fear became more palpable in later years. At times, the woman felt like an invisible counter working inside her, and this device increasingly signaled that the time of her happiness was inexorably coming to an end. This feeling of incomprehensible doom constrained her at night. But in the morning, she forgot it, thinking her fears unfounded. One day on her lunch break, she had an intimate conversation with a coworker. Alex, do you ever feel like you're waiting for something bad to happen? Wendy pulled her eyes out perplexed. No, I don't. I'm an optimist in life. I only think positive thoughts. You would go to a psychologist, consult it. Perhaps you have problems against the background of work or family workload. What kind of trouble? No, Wendy. My family is nice and calm. But it's that calmness that worries me. The friend thought for a minute, then said sternly, put away the bad thoughts, try to switch your mind. I have a friend, she is a psychologist. By the way, I could arrange with her to take you in. So she advised me that in such moments, when the light is not nice, you should switch to something positive, like asking me to go back to the store and buy a bunch of unnecessary junk. Molly smiled I'm not used to wasting money. Then take a vacation, change the scenery. Molly liked the second option better, and she even wanted to discuss it with her husband, but she didn't have time. William that evening returned from work tired and went straight to the bedroom. Molly paid no attention to this and continued to fuss in the kitchen. She made dinner, set the table. Only after that she decided to check what her husband was doing. William was asleep, so she started to stir him up. You shouldn't sleep at this hour. What are you going to do at night? The man struggled to open his eyes. Molly, I don't feel well. My whole body's aching. It's hard to breathe. I better lie down for a while. The woman exclaimed. I did my best to cook dinner. William did not want to offend his wife and, overcoming weakness, got out of bed. He dined without appetite. I didn't see that the process gave him agony. William, don't push yourself. Eating through force. Have some tea and go to rest. She felt sorry for her husband and in a burst of sincere feelings, she kissed him on the forehead and immediately recoiled. That's what you're burning up. Do you need to take your temperature? The man smiled strainedly. It's probably nothing. The draughts got me through with a caring wife like you. I'll get better in no time. In the morning, Molly excused himself from work and called a doctor at home. The elderly doctor and listened to William's lungs for a long time, but did not reveal anything suspicious. It was nothing. It's just a common cold. But you should still be on bed rest for three days, the district doctors gave a correct prognosis on the third day the man felt better and closed the sick list. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but two weeks later, the picture was repeated again. 
Only now, in addition to weakness, fever, and shortness of breath appeared, Molly called the doctor again, who immediately expressed her displeasure. Why are you surprised, lady? Did your spouse have to strictly follow my recommendations? Molly mumbled confusedly. He did everything. Doctor looked first at the woman with disbelief, then with an unkind look at the patient. If he had done everything I told him to do, he wouldn't have relapsed. The woman asked the doctor uncertainly, wouldn't the husband have something other than a cold? Should we examine him? Should we do some imaging? I wish she hadn't said that. The doctor was furious in the truest sense of the word. His carefully shaved face, Nelly elk paint and vapor appeared on his forehead. If you know everything, then why did you call the doctor? You think I have nothing else to do? Nothing to do, but idly run around the neighborhood. The woman was numb with surprise, and the sick man tried to stand up for his wife. Doctor, why are you yelling at my wife? She suggested a perfectly rational solution, and I don't mind taking a picture. Another smart ass. Your lungs are clear, so I don't see the need. The doctor's tone has returned to normal, but his hands were still shaking when he wrote the prescription. These are the capsules you'll take twice a day, and you'll have a general blood test before you're discharged. The doctor walked down the hallway, his whole appearance showing that he resented the patient and his wife. Before he left, he stayed at the door for a while. I have 35 years of experience. If you don't trust me, go to another specialist. On the day of discharge, William did not see the doctor at the clinic and went to see another doctor. The doctor did not even examine him and closed his sick leave. The man hesitantly asked your colleague, saying that I need to take blood for analysis. In response, he heard something familiar. What illiterate patient we have now. Everyone knows how to treat themselves, but for some reason they go to doctors. You don't need to test for anything. All your vital signs are normal. You could send him into space tomorrow. The doctors are clearly mocking him. This made William feel extremely uncomfortable. He hurried out of the office and mentally made a vow. I'll never set foot in this place again. At home. He briefly told Molly about his hike and repeated out loud Molly, can you imagine how embarrassed I was? I've never been to a hospital before and I won't go again. Molly did not dissuade her husband, believing that the danger was over. When William had another relapse a month later, he wouldn't let her call a doctor. Molly, I don't want to go there again. I've got some pills from last time. I'll swallow them. See if they make me feel better. On the third night, my husband's condition worsened dramatically. He began to choke, and his face turned into a blue mask. Panic seized the woman, and she began to rush around the apartment. Good thing her son was home. Mom was running around. This is getting us nowhere. We need to call an ambulance. The medics who came to the call immediately took the patient to the hospital. Until morning Molly and her son sat under the doors of the intensive care unit. She had a lot on her mind during those hours. It was good that Thomas was nearby, although he was very worried about his father, but tried to support his mother. We'll be fine. Dad is strong, he's been playing sports all his life. He's going to make it. But there was no optimism in the words of the doctor who came to them in the morning. It's a very rare and very complicated case. I've never seen anything like this before. Your husband has an advanced inflammatory process. The outer shell is affected, the heart is aggravated. The fact that the inflammation is affecting important areas, the tissues have, roughly speaking, spread apart. That's why the heart isn't doing its job. I'm not gonna get your hopes up just yet. It's a very serious case. She wanted to cry, there were no tears. She wanted to scream, but a gasp and a degree escaped from her throat. Thomas tried to bring her mother to her senses, but she sat in a state of tetanus, not answering his questions. The guy had to seek medical attention. The pungent odor of the tent brought the woman back to reality, and she whispered softly, Why didn't I do it right away? I felt it to me intuition. How many times it told me misfortune was about to happen. Tears broke the dam. Patience and the woman burst into tears on her son's shoulder. It seemed to her that time had stopped. Every day was similar to the previous one, because even relatives were not allowed into the intensive care unit. They had to wait in the cramped lobby in front of the ward. Almost four days Molly spent in the stuffy room. 
but she never heard anything comforting from the doctors. On the fifth day, her husband's attending physician invited her into the resident's office. His face was impenetrable, but his voice was reassuring. Molly, we need to talk to you. The woman did not ask the doctor any unnecessary questions and went with him to the next ward. There was no one in the resident's room, and Sebastian noted with satisfaction that my colleagues are examining their patients now, so you and I will be able to talk quietly. The doctor adjusted his horn-rimmed glasses and looked at the woman, who was shaking with excitement. Molly, do you need to calm down? Worry and panic are unacceptable in situations like this, because they interfere with the common cause. And you and I have a difficult job to do. The woman was surprised to see you and me. The doctor smiled. Why are you surprised? You have probably heard before that it is difficult for a doctor to cope alone without the help of relatives. So you and I will have to form an alliance of sorts in order to act properly and in a coordinated manner. Are you ready for that? The ray of hope that shone in the woman's soul began to gain strength at the first words of the medic. Of course, Sebastian, I will do anything. Just to make my husband well. The doctor smiled again. I didn't expect any other answer from you. And your husband said you were like a tough tin soldier. That could be considered a compliment, though most women are more accustomed to hearing other comparisons. Molly hesitantly interrupted the doctor. You say William said that. Then he's better. Sebastian drew his eyebrows together and his face instantly became stern and even severe. Yes, your husband's condition has improved thanks to comprehensive therapy. But the danger is not over. Because the main problem is not eliminated. I will not go into detail, so as not to scare you with obscure terms and try to describe the situation in simple words. As a result of a neglected long-term process, if I may put it this way, an important part of the heart has been put out of action. The tissues are so affected that they are unable to perform their functions. In hospital conditions, we can keep the organ working, but you realize that this cannot last indefinitely. Molly Capital, I understand and do what? Say your husband. Maybe our domestic doctors have developed a unique method of heart valve replacement, but you understand that it will require money and a lot of it. Molly physically felt a ray of hope light up. At full force, she began to nod her head intensely. Sebastian, I will definitely find the necessary amount of money. You just tell me when the operation will be. The doctor spread his hands. I can't give you a specific date yet. Although William's condition has improved considerably, he is still very weak. And the second reason is that the method I told you about has some technological peculiarities which also requires some time. If there are no complications, then after two to three weeks, you can do the surgery. And if I don't have the surgery, what will happen to my husband? Sebastian looked away. Unfortunately, in this case, the sad outcome is inevitable. Without hardware support, he won't be able to live at all. Therefore, surgery is the only salvation. The doctor saw the impression his words made on the unfortunate woman but Sebastian couldn't do otherwise. He knew that it was a crime to encourage both the sick and their relatives. He was truly sorry for this woman who was worried about her husband's life with all her heart, but he could not deceive her. Noticing the burned out light in Molly's eyes, Sebastian dismissed the professional tone. Don't despair, Molly. In cases like yours, even the only chance you get is to keep you informed. And as soon as your husband's condition allows me to talk about the surgery, I'll let you know. Molly left her phone number and walked out of the resident's office. She did not yet know where to get the necessary amount of money to save her husband, but she was sure that she would find the money. Exactly a week had passed since the conversation with the attending physician, but little or no progress had been made in the financial matter. The family budget currently has a huge hole in it, because even before his illness William invested all his savings in a project he had been working on for many years. Together with his colleague, he decided to create intellectual centers for young people on a voluntary basis. According to the plan, this multidisciplinary center was to become a place where young people would have the opportunity to master interesting directions. The teacher's initiative was actively supported by the city administration, but they said that there was no money for its realization. William came home after the meeting excited, 
and he was not disappointed with the response of the authorities. As he admitted to Molly, Of course, I am not a dreamer detached from real life, but I still hoped that besides empty words, the administration will allocate at least a penny. After all, it is necessary for all business a real opportunity for teenagers to do something useful, instead of wandering aimlessly around the city. And then we all lament why our juvenile delinquency is not decreasing. Molly was privy to her husband's clan, because she worked for the Department of Education. She had warned William even earlier that they would not be able to get funding from the municipal budget. But her husband didn't believe it. Now that he was convinced of the truth of her words, she wanted to reassure him. William, but he also knew it would be like this. Should you have thought of alternative means of financing in advance? The man exclaimed Molly, what are you talking about? If you mean fundraising or sponsorship, I'm not gonna walk around town with my hand out. I'd rather invest my own money, but I won't be begging. Molly guessed that her husband intended to use the money they had been saving for years to start a family business. Nancy had given them the idea. The daughter even promised to develop a business plan, but then quickly burned out. But the head of the family grasped the idea and infected his son with it. However, until the men did not come to a consensus on the choice of direction of activity, Thomas wanted to engage in the repair of computer equipment. The elder Nance was more attracted to cars, when William's life's work was in danger of complete failure. He said emphatically, since it's such a turnaround, I'll put my money in. I think Greg will back me up. Molly was at a loss. Vova, what about our family business? And what are you going to tell Thomas? After all, the guy lived for this project. The man smiled. Molly, nothing fundamentally changes, because there are opportunities to combine the two projects. In addition, you can make part of the center's services on a fee basis. The woman objected, and do you think that people will come to you in droves? If the price is reasonable, then it is quite possible. The main thing is to serve our dishes properly. I hope Nancy will help us with that. For nothing. She's been in college for five years. But it's one thing to think of something and another to realize it. Greg didn't immediately agree to contribute his blood money to the cause. So William had to use his eloquence. He described the future prospects in vivid colors. And he gave in. The companions divided the responsibilities and began to implement the project. At that time, William was already experiencing serious health problems. Therefore, he was in a great hurry to finish what he had started. It was as if he felt that he was hamstrung by illness. Nance handed over the money to the company, but not long before he was hospitalized. Molly therefore turned to Greg in the first place, hoping that their family capital had not yet been put to use. She called her husband's co-worker. Greg, I'm sorry to bother you, but we have an extremely difficult situation. Greg impatiently interrupted the woman. Yes, Molly, I'm aware of that. I stopped by the hospital the day before yesterday, but they wouldn't let me see William. He's in intensive care. He's in very serious condition. Be strong, Molly. God willing, everything will be all right. The doctor said that only surgery will help William. The man again impatiently interrupted the woman. Molly, trust our doctors. They are real wizards in white coats. A year ago, a relative of my wife almost gave away the ends. So the woman was overwhelmed by blind rage. She cut off Grigory at half a word. I have also heard about the exploits of our doctors. But I now believe me, not to stories of miraculous healing, strangers. At the moment, I am most concerned about my husband's life. He can only be saved by emergency surgery. That's why I need money. Greg asked cheerfully. I don't understand Molly. What does this have to do with me? I want to take our money. Greg Key. What money? The one William gave you to set up the center. The man paused for a few seconds. And then he said firmly, I sympathize with you, Molly. But to my great regret, I can't help you. All the money has already been invested in our project, and it is impossible to take it back. And in general, in business, such games are unacceptable. Today I gave it, tomorrow I will take it back. We have already rented the premises for the center and attracted specialists for work. Molly shouted into the phone to me what to do. My husband is dying. The silence lasted almost half a minute. 
Then Greg hesitantly said don't be so nervous. Molly, I'd love to help you, but I have almost nothing left. I'll try to ask my colleagues. Maybe a group of us can throw together a little something for a comrade. Although I'm not sure we'll be able to raise the required amount. But you Molly, keep me informed. She didn't have time to answer because Greg had passed out. Bitter resentment and pain for her loved one overwhelmed the woman's heart. She was sure it would work that way. After all, it wasn't even a month after William had made such a reckless use of their family fortune. Molly pulled out her list of friends she thought could help her. Second on that list was the family of a childhood friend. But Cindy had also flatly turned her down. Meeting her had left an unpleasant residue in her soul. And the woman was afraid to call other people on the list. Molly took the bus to the final stop and unsuccessfully. She made her way to the regional hospital. The woman's brain drills one single thought where to get money for the operation. The most fantastic ways to get the necessary amount came to mind. So she then immediately from the metal and thinking was interrupted by the ringing of a cell phone. It was so unexpected that the woman flinched. She calmed down when she heard her daughter's voice. Mom, I'm here. Where are you? Nancy, I can't talk long now because I'm going to see Daddy in the hospital. Her daughter's answer stumped her. You're going for a long time, Mommy. Vitaly Semyonovich and I are already tired of waiting for you. We're in a hurry. There is positive news. Molly added a step. Nancy's cheerful voice. Especially her words made her heart flutter and sick. She went up to the third floor, where her daughter was already waiting for her at the elevator. The girl took her mother under her arm and behind Tara Torquina, without giving her a moment's hesitation. First, let's go to Dad. He was transferred from the intensive care unit to the intensive care ward. The woman was surprised, why did you push me then? You told me Sebastian was waiting for me and the doctor in charge called him, but he'll be back soon. I'll tell you a big secret. Dad was seen today by some big shot specialist from the capital. I didn't see him because I got there later. But Sebastian said that today or tomorrow the operation will be decided. That's probably why the head doctor called him in. I hope you found the money. Suddenly Molly's legs gave out. The woman swayed and Nancy frightenedly asked Mommy, what's wrong with you? You almost fell. She hurried to reassure her daughter. I'm fine. I'm just emotional today and it's all about the money for the surgery. Daughter, I don't know what to do. I don't know who else to turn to. The girl remarked with irritation. But you said a few days ago that there would be no problems. Did I think that the people I was sure of would turn me down? Molly handed her daughter the list. Of course, I haven't called everyone yet, but now I'm not sure I should. I don't know what else to do. I was hoping for sympathy, but I've been met with total incomprehension. Even my best friend, for whom William and I have done so much, flatly refused to mommy. Friends and girlfriends like that need to be cut off. There's a reason they say that friends are friends in need. And your Cindy, if that's who you mean, she's a woman. I realized that when I was in third grade, and you were always feeding her. Now you got Molly's gratitude, Nancy resented. You can't talk about people like that. You had to come up with such an insulting nickname for a vacuum cleaner. Aunt Cindy and Daddy's friend have their own problems. And here I am, out of the blue, with my request. Mom, you surprise me. You've been ditched and you're still defending those pseudo-friends on your list. The girl soon read squeamishly and grimaced. I can't stand such slippery characters. Okay, let it be on their conscience. Come on, let's go see Daddy in his room. But don't say anything to him. We'll talk to you later about where else we can get money. I've got a couple of options. What are they? Well, for instance, we could get a loan from the bank, but that's not gonna work. It's too much money. Then we could sell something. Natasha, if you're talking about the farm, no one will give us a dime for it. And if we sell the apartment, we'll have nowhere to live. I could ask Adam. Who's Adam? You know, like my fiance, we've been seeing each other a long time. He hasn't proposed to me yet, but Kathy has relatives and they have money. And he has an expert appraising paintings and rarities. I don't think we should ask daddy for your date. Why are you being so conventional again, daughter? There are certain boundaries of propriety that should not be crossed. 
Okay, you and I are having a real argument and attracting unnecessary attention. A nurse came out of the room with a hammer in her hand. She looked suspiciously at the mother and daughter. You may go through, but not for more than five minutes. William is still very weak, so try not to disturb him. Nancy hastened to reassure the girl. Don't worry, we won't talk about serious matters. As soon as they crossed the threshold of the ward, Molly almost lost her senses again. She stared in horror at her husband, who was tangled on all sides with wires from his mouth. A tube was coming loose. The woman rushed to her spouse's bedside. William Dieter, how are you, Nancy, did not have time to hold her mother, so caught up with her already laid sick father. She whispered, Mom, you have emotions, or we will be kicked out of here. At this time, the man opened his eyes with difficulty. He couldn't speak as he was hooked up to the machine, but his eyes expressed joy. To keep her mother from messing things up, Nancy pulled her aside and worked on the field. You're doing great and you look good. You look a bit like a diver. Soon you'll be all better and we'll all go on vacation together. Unless, of course, I'm married by then. William's face cut a little in his eyes and a merry light danced in his eyes. He raised a thumb on his hand, which meant approval in the highest degree. Molly calmed down a little and also wanted to cheer up her spouse. But at that time a nurse came into the room and in a stern voice said Sebastian is expecting you. The women left the room, but Nancy stopped on the threshold. Daddy, hang in there. We're going to be all right. The man lowered his eyelids, signaling his agreement with the gesture. Sebastian sat pensively at his desk in the resident's office, flipping through someone's medical records. When the women entered the room, he waved at a row of chairs against the wall. Have a seat. Unfortunately, I don't have much time, so I'll be very brief. Today your father and husband were examined by a very competent specialist. He's a renowned cardiac surgeon. He and I used to work together. In short, there's a possibility of an operation in the next few days. Nancy jumped up and down in her chair with excitement. Oh, Sebastian, you have no idea what you've done for us, do you? Thank you so much. The doctor looked at the girl for a moment. Saving people is my job. And so far, there's nothing to thank me for. I only tried to speed up the process, because even one missed day does not play in your father's favor. Nancy nodded her head. Yes, of course, we understand. Tell me, will you be operating on dad? The doctor immediately replied, no, not me. I have a different profile, but don't worry. My friend, who today conducted an examination, works in the cardiac center, and there are specialists of the highest qualification. Of course, no one can guarantee a favorable result of the operation, but let's hope for the best. Molly stammered and said, thank you, doctor, but I didn't expect that everything would turn out so quickly. The thing is, we haven't raised the required amount of money yet. Sebastian began nervously twirling the pencil in his hand, but he misjudged his strength and broke the writing instrument. Molly, what am I supposed to do now? I worked so hard to get the best specialist to examine your husband. He found a way to operate on him off the books. What am I going to tell him tomorrow? Do you realize the position you put me in? Nancy, I sensed a scandal was brewing. I hastily reassured Sebastian. It's all right. We're going to transfer dad to the center. Let him have the surgery. We'll pay for it. We can even write a receipt. The doctor looked at the girl with disbelief. A special contract is drawn up for all services, on the basis of which payment is made. Are you sure there won't be any problems with payment? Nancy cheerfully replied, do I look like a cheater to you? As they walked out of the resident's office, Molly lashed out at her daughter. Nancy, what are you up to? Do you have any idea what will happen if your venture fails? The girl was a little embarrassed. Of course I do. But you mom, you're good too. She promised the doctor herself. You know, if you're not sure, you shouldn't promise. It's not like playing in a sandbox. You don't need to teach your mother. Why don't you tell me what you're thinking? Nancy sighed. I'm gonna go with plan B. I mean, I'm gonna shake Adam. Failure of your scheme will not give us money you're expert. I'll give it a shot. I'm not wasting any time. Adam's probably waiting for me. And you, mommy, stay in touch. Nancy jumped into the elevator, which just stopped on the third floor, leaving her mother at a loss. 
Molly initially wanted to follow her daughter's example, but changed her mind. Nancy wouldn't let me talk to William. I'm going to stay with him for a while. She went toward the room where her husband was lying. Suddenly, the door swung open in front of her. A strange woman stepped out of the room, clad in all black. Molly jumped aside, thinking, oh my God, what this person needs is a scythe in her hands. The woman didn't even look at her and walked majestically past. It was only when she disappeared into the elevator that Molly came to her senses. Who was this aunt and what was she doing in the ward to get answers to these questions? Molly rushed to catch up, but the elevator was stuck somewhere between floors, so she ran to the emergency exit. And in less than a minute, she was down on the first floor. But the stranger in black was no longer there. And the woman on duty at the elevator asked in surprise, did you lose someone? Molly gasped after the rapid descent and with difficulty mumbled. Oh, there was just an elderly woman here. Say, where did she go? He waved his hand vaguely that way. It's your relative. You'll catch up with her and if you sign. Despite regular exercise, even moderate running was difficult for her. So her strength was running out. When she spotted a familiar figure at the bus stop, as nothing heralded the imminent arrival of public transportation, Molly spared her speed to catch her breath a little. She was almost there when a foreign car dashing to the stop and the driver, a face she couldn't see, said loudly to Kelly. Jump in the back seat, the woman in black rather briskly rushed to the car on the run thanking the guys. Oh Arthur, how nice of you to notice me at the nimble jerk in the back seat Molly rushed to the car. Wait, please. The woman the stranger looked at her with surprise from the window of the car. Molly readied herself bursting with despair. She unbearably wanted to know what was doing in the room of her dying husband woman, whom she had never seen in her life. All sorts of thoughts popped into her head, leaving her even more confused. Suddenly it hit her. She had to go back to the hospital and ask the nurse. After the unplanned jogging her back and legs were afraid. So she had to walk back the normal way. The nurse on duty was sitting at the desk at her post. The girl was dutifully making marks in the patient's medical histories. When Molly asked, she answered without hesitation that she was your husband's relative. That's why I let her in. She even showed me her passport. Her last name is Nance. Of course, I didn't remember the name. The last name confirms the relationship, so it's legal. And there are no claims against me. This information made the woman freeze in place. The nurse looked at her with judgment. As long as I work here, I never cease to be amazed at the strangeness that happens to people. First they fight, then they cut ties, then they look for someone to lean on. Didn't you recognize your relative? Molly answered nothing. She was tired of the turmoil of the day. She wanted to go home as soon as possible. The thoughts ran restlessly through her head again. She was no longer able to regulate their flow. It was only in the evening that she regained the ability to assess the situation sensibly. Most of all, she was worried about this strange woman who, as if out of nowhere, had exploded into her life. Molly realized that this was particularly unfit to be a mistress due to her venerable age. Then who was she, this stranger? Kathy did not hear the door of her small workshop open. Inspiration had been with her since early morning, and she had decided to use it to the full, at times like this, the young woman's nerves were like a taut string, so she felt the presence of a stranger in the room. Aunt Kelly, it's you. The statuesque figure of the guardian came out of the shadows. Yes, my beauty. I had already returned and reluctantly averted my gaze. How many times have I told you not to cheer from behind? Do you know how unpleasant it is to feel someone else's breath on the back of your neck? The older woman took a step aside. I'm not a stranger to you. I just didn't want to distract you from your work. You're doing a beautiful job. And where did this talent come from? The girl smiled. You don't know that the gods give people talents, and almost everyone gets an equal share. But not everyone knows about their gift, so I'm still lucky. Kelly crossed herself and said a silent prayer only after this obligatory ritual. She turned to the artist. You must have prayed all the way through, huh? You probably didn't eat a thing. And Kathy took up her brush again. I'm not hungry. The old woman exclaimed. What do you feed on, holy air? Look at you. All dried up. 
Come on, drop everything and go to the kitchen. As long as you don't eat, I won't cling from you and Hayes smiled okay. Aunt Kelly, I obey you, and will take the proper portion of food to support my brain and body. But first you tell me how the trip went. It's really my father. Kelly muttered in the kitchen I'll tell you everything. She turned and walked resolutely out of Kathy's studio, putting aside her brush and heading for the door as well. The girl had a slight limp, but this flaw was only noticeable upon close observation. Kathy was born with congenital abnormalities, and only thanks to Aunt Tasia this defect was almost completely eliminated. But still the girl was ashamed of her defect and tried to appear on the street less often. She spent all her free time in a small workshop, which was allocated to her by her aunt in her school years. Kathy was in the fifth grade when her talent became fully apparent. She started drawing even before she learned to walk. But even then, laziness and circles, drawn out on paper with a child's pen, represented a whole. The teacher in kindergarten amazed such a little girl draws as a master artist. It is a pity only that Kromchenko was born a chromosome culprit. The girl had different lengths of limbs to minimize defects, and Sina had to lie for months on the hoods and walk with a metal structure on the leg that was shorter. So her only solace for many years remained drawing. In the fifth grade, the doctor allowed her to attend public school. But classmates met the new girl with contempt. They openly mocked the girl, calling her a lame leg, although her family suffered greatly from the ridicule of peers. She never allowed herself to cry in public, only in Kelly's cozy home. She felt protected. All her troubles and offenses the girl also confided only to her guardian Nyasha, and she calmed her down. Don't tear up your heart, my girl. It's not what a person has on the outside that matters. It's what's inside that counts. God has not wronged you with talent. Your drawings bring joy to people. You'll see it. The day will come when the whole world will be at your feet. And Kathy believed in this prediction. All her free time she devoted to her favorite occupation. The young artist's first solo exhibition took place when she was in seventh grade. Then 20 of her brightest works on the initiative of the class teacher exhibited in the lobby of the old movie theater at the local Vernissage, quite by chance, was a correspondent of the regional newspaper. He came to visit his relatives and they dragged him to the event. The guy was pretty good at painting and he was immediately attracted to the artwork. Kathy, of course, it is not fashionable, but a clear nugget. I would have loved to meet the author of these undoubtedly talented works in a small village that practically merges with the regional center. Everyone knew each other, so it was not difficult to arrange a meeting between the journalist and the young artist. But Kathy was embarrassed by everyone's attention, and she behaved like a frightened animal. For this reason, the reporter's questions had to be answered by Kelly. Just the next day in the regional newspaper appeared in a small article about Kathy. But the laurels of unexpected fame frightened the girl, and she even missed two days of school classes. Concerned about her absence, the class teacher came to their house. Kathy, what is it school absenteeism or pride? Kelly had to defend her ward's honor. What are you saying, Tamara Mitrofanovna? What kind of pride is that? The girl is afraid to show her face on the street. The class teacher convinced Spring not to do anything stupid. Talent is a very heavy burden. If you let it out of your hands, it won't come back. So the girl prepare for the difficulties, will not lose its most valuable asset, and still have to go to school. The next day, the family crossed the threshold of the classroom with fear. She was greeted with shouts of, Kathy, you're great. We're proud of you. Her classmates had even prepared posters. Arthur handed her a bunch of wildflowers. In the evening, she timidly asked permission to walk her home. All week Kathy was the epicenter of attention. Therefore, when the passions settled down a little, the girl exhaled with relief. Kathy's moment of fame did not pass without a trace. Classmates began to look at her with respect, and she had a real friend. In the person of Arthur, but most importantly, no one called her a limp leg anymore. Kelly also reaped the rewards of her first success. The pragmatic woman was eager to channel Kathy's talent in the right direction. One evening, Auntie said, my gold, now you can earn your bread with your skills. By the way, a good friend of mine wants to give her husband an unusual gift for his anniversary. 
maybe you can paint something beautiful and blue could not refuse the woman who replaced her mother. Three days she worked on the order, and the first client was delighted. It's unbelievable. I had no idea our cabin looked so beautiful in the picture. Everything is in place here and the backdrop, the well, and even the cat on the bench was drawn that fall. Oh, thank you. That was a great gift, even though all the cheers were directed at Kelly. Kathy felt a sense of creative satisfaction. She'd received a small fee for her first job, but her wise aunt assured her it was a start. We'll raise the price list later. If I wanted to object, Aunt Kelly, it's awkward to take money from your acquaintances. The woman looked at her sideways. It's uncomfortable to sleep on the ceiling because the blanket falls down. Don't think, I won't take a penny. I'll raise money for your studies. The woman sank down on a chair and dreamily rolled her eyes. My little girl, the day will come and you will enter the academy where art is taught. You'll be famous all over the world. Your father, as he learns of your success, will bite his elbows. This revelation made the girl wary, because before Kelly had always avoided talking about her parents. The girl nestled against the shoulder of her guardian aunt. Say, where is he? Why did he give up on me? It's because of my limp you on Molly's eyes glistened tears. But this time the guardian didn't give a straight answer either. God knows where he is. I haven't made any inquiries about him, and your mother didn't tell me anything. The old woman realized that in a burst of joyful feelings made an unforgivable blunder if she was not a very vulnerable girl. Therefore, the truth about her parents could have a devastating effect on her. The years passed, and Kathy never asked any more uncomfortable questions. Only once did she confess to Aunt Kelly. If he even shows up, I won't talk to him. That statement took the woman by surprise. Oh baby, who is he? Your father? I'll never forgive him for leaving me. Kelly was ready to tell Sienna the whole truth. Her soul became a volcano. A nasty voice in her head whispered. Tell everything without carrying it in your heart. A stone is a great sin. She had already prepared for confession, but her lips were numb as if in paralysis. Kathy didn't notice that something was wrong with her aunt. And in a different tone of voice, she said, I don't want to talk about him anymore. I'll go to the workshop. But as folk wisdom says, you can't hide the truth for long. Since a week ago, the very same neighbor ran in to see her. For her husband, who many years ago and blue painted a picture, the woman beckoned the landlady outside. Kelly and an urgent conversation. Kelly stepped out onto the porch and closed the door tightly behind her. Spit it out. What do you got? The neighbor hesitated and I'm not sure. Maybe it's false information. You know my sister-in-law works at the regional hospital. Well, I do. What about it? That William Nance was admitted the other day, William, and he's 46 years old. The woman was so dry with excitement that her tongue was glued to her palate with great difficulty. And she mumbled maybe it's a coincidence? There are few namesakes in the world. Kelly but the middle name fits. That's for sure. Your husband's offspring. You should check it out. If you want, I'll have my sister-in-law look into it. Okay, I'm fine with that. The next day, the neighbor showed up again. She was impatient, so she let her guard down. Kelly nothing concrete could not be found out, because this Nance, considering that at death he has a wife pleasant, such a woman and two children that are already grown up, so they don't leave the hospital. They're all crying. Kelly whispered to her neighbor, or she hears something, and they be wary of her. It's all right, she's very impressionable. Tell me, what's wrong with this patient? My sister-in-law said his heart's failing. He's in need of emergency surgery. Nance's relatives don't seem to have any money. The daughter-in-law heard the daughter and the mother talking about where they could borrow money. That's the story. Kelly thanked the neighbor and opened the door, where her family was waiting for her to return. The girl immediately jumped at the guardian's noise. Aunt Kelly, I heard everything, and I understand what you were saying about my father. Is it true that he is dying? The old woman did not expect such a turn of events. Kathy, I don't know. Most likely, it's a stranger who had a misfortune. The girl leaned against the door jam. What if it's my father? My aunt met him. But you said not so long ago you didn't want to see him. And now I want to see him. What if he dies? 
I'll never get to see him. I have to go tonight and find out. Kelly realized that her word was no longer valid, and she no longer had the right to refuse Molly's wish to see her father. All that remained was the hope that the full namesake of the man who had once abandoned the girl's mother was in the hospital. Kathy called Arthur and asked him to take her into town. But soon the girl returned and to the aunt's mute question answered this man is still in intensive care and there are not allowed. But I managed to talk to our neighbor's sister-in-law and she confirmed that he was being prepared for surgery. She also said he should be transferred out of the ICU tomorrow. Kelly asked if you want, I can go into town tomorrow and find out. The girl cheerfully picked up on it. Of course I do. I'll ask Arthur. The aunt waved her off. Don't fidget, boys without end. He'll fulfill your every whim as it is. The only thing I can't figure out is when your obscure friendship will turn into something normal. What do you mean? Kathy, don't play dumb. You're a grown woman. At your age, everyone already has a family and children. The girl's face instantly became impenetrable. Aunt Kelly, let's not touch that subject. Arthur, he's been great to me. He's a great friend, but I have no right to deprive him of real happiness. Who needs a wife with such a flaw? Auntie twisted his finger at the temple and with an expression said fool you and do not treat. It's time to get rid of childish complexes. You are no worse than your peers. All at you and a pretty face and a limp figure. A smart person wouldn't pay attention to that. In the evening of the same day, Kathy snuck into Auntie's bedroom and with a look of conspiratorial whispering Aunt Kelly I came up with. The older woman stared at her in bewilderment. What are you talking about? About that man who may well turn out to be my father. Go ahead and say it. What stray thought came to you? The girl put forward her palms, as if defending herself from an invisible enemy. Only you do not interrupt me well. Come on, do not pull the cat by the tail. And then like a grandfather pike talk riddles. Auntie, I've decided to pay for the operation. I've got money lying around anyway. Kelly jumped out of bed. The shock was so strong that she couldn't utter a word. Only after about two minutes the woman came to her senses. You are definitely insane. Giving money to save a complete stranger. What if it's my father? I'll never forgive myself for not helping him. Kelly sank down on the bed in silence. The hay was silent for a while. Then she said firmly, as if it were a done deal. Even if it's not my father, I'd still be happy to save someone's life. Guardian. Kathy tried to object timidly. What about the apartment? I thought you wanted to move to the city. You're not doing too badly here. All night Kelly kept her eyes open. And in the morning, she took the bus to the hospital. She found her sister-in-law at a neighbor's house and handed her an envelope of money. It's easier for you to do the paperwork here. It's for Nance Williams' surgery. The neighbor tried to refuse Aunt Kelly's errand at first, but I had never asked you for anything. Do me a favor. Having accomplished her mission, the older woman decided to visit the patient after all. The nurse didn't want to let her into the room at first, but then allowed her to come in for two minutes. Kelly immediately recognized him, although she had only seen him in a photograph, which she always kept with her. The woman whispered quietly that was accurate. He hadn't changed at all, only his hair redone. She headed for the exit, but at the door she bumped into a woman who looked like the man's wife by description. Therefore, Kelly did not rush to leave the hospital. She saw that woman following her, but she didn't want to talk to her. All the way in Arthur's car, she kept thinking that it was time to tell Molly. But Aunt Kelly was afraid the girl wouldn't want to do anything with her after that. Kelly did not without haste set the table as well and at the same time thought, where would she start the conversation with Molly? But the girl beat her to it. She crept noiselessly into the kitchen and asked loudly someone threatened to feed me until I lost my pulse. The elderly woman turned around frightened. How can you joke like that? My heart may fail from fright. How do you scare me? So you've decided to get back at your aunt? Well, thank you. Kelly lived to see the light of day appreciate it in case I didn't realize I was overdoing it. She hugged her aunt. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I thought we'd have fun together. So tell me, how was your trip? Auntie's a little reserved, huh? She said she was fine. I gave her the money, asked her to make the arrangements. 
so I did your job. The girl looked into the eyes of her benefactor. You didn't tell me the main thing. Did you see him? Apparently, it's your father. Suddenly, the older woman collapsed in her chair and wrapped her arms around her head. She burst into tears loudly, so it was difficult to make out what she was saying. There is no forgiveness for me. It's all blind hatred. I wanted revenge for my ruining her love so badly. I thought revenge would make me feel better, but it only made it worse. And the blue ones were worried sick about my aunt. What's wrong with you? What revenge are you talking about? I'll tell you everything. I can't carry this burden any longer. Take there in the book on the shelf war and peace call the letter. Kelly lost her tears, but new bouts of despair overcame her. She told me to give this letter to her, and I hid it. I thought it would be better for everyone. No, I'm lying to you. I was afraid they'd take you away from me. You're blue. The only thing I have for you I live for. The girl frantically leafed through volume after volume of the legendary work. Finally, out of one book fell a yellowed envelope on the floor with trembling hands. She took out a notebook leaf from it and began to read the lines written out in smooth handwriting. William, I'm sorry I haven't answered your letters. I thought it would be best for both of us. My Aunt Kelly told me right away that I was no match for you. You're educated. I've only got nine grades under my belt, but I don't regret anything because I loved you and I love you very much. I'm writing to let you know that you have a daughter. I did not want to alarm you and you would not know anything about us. But as it happens, I don't have long to live. You know that I am not used to complaining and I will accept everything that fate has prepared for me. The only thing I ask you to take care of is our little girl. And the family did not know how long she sat with this letter and in her hands outside the window. Dusk was already thickening. My aunt's food remained untouched on the table. Kelly sat on the same table without moving. For a moment, it seemed to her that she was not breathing. The girl rushed to her aunt. Aunt Kelly, don't be silent. You're scaring me. Why didn't you show me this letter before? Why didn't you tell me anything about my parents? I was afraid. I was very afraid that you would be taken away from me. But at first I wanted revenge. But now there's no point in keeping silent. I'll tell you everything. Childhood years of youth flew in a small village, located near the regional center. When it was time to choose a profession, she and her crony Lucy went to enroll in a trade school. Both girlfriends successfully passed the exams and were enrolled. Of course, in addition to classes and girls, did not deny themselves in visiting fun activities. Every Saturday they went dancing at the House of Culture. There Kelly and met James, who studied at the construction college. Between the young people immediately burst into love, since both of them had already turned 18. They decided to cement the relationship with a somber bond. When they happily showed up at the registry office to apply, the head met them unfriendly. Jesus, you don't have milk on your lips and you're already in a hurry to get married. Do your parents even know? This treatment angered the groom, and he went down. What do you care if we told our parents or not? We are adult citizens and have every right to enter into a consensual marriage. Really, Kelly confirmed cheerfully, yes, you can't forbid us. The official looked contemptuously at them kindergarten. What should I do with you? Write an application. Maybe in three months you can think of one. Kelly got a little cocky. No, auntie's not gonna change her mind. Because we love each other. They filed the application and walked out of the registry office with a sense of accomplishment. James picked the girl up in his arms and spun around with her. We did it. You and I are heroes. The girl was also excited and already imagined herself in a slinky dress. But she didn't want to move beyond the wedding in her imagination. Three months flew by quickly. Of course, the parents of the newlyweds were shocked when they found out about the wedding. The bride and groom informed them of the momentous event only a week before the celebration. They were very afraid that the ancestors would upset their wedding, but they did not have time to play the wedding fanfare. As the newly married husband received a summons from the military enlistment office, the send-off was also noisy. The young wife, as it should be, promised to wait for her lover from the army. She ran after the bus that took the conscripts away and shouted, James, you write to me. You can write every day and I'll write back. For the first few months, 
letters from the soldier came regularly. And then the string broke. Kelly rushed to her husband's parents, trying to find out if he was in some kind of trouble, but there were no relatives at home. Kelly was anxious to vent her frustrations, and Lucy agreed to be her comforting vest. Her friend reassured her not to lie. It's no use. Tears will work out. You know, as in the army, everything is strict. They have their then and then exercises, then combat training. Or maybe your James was sent on a special mission, like in the movies? Kelly believed Lucy because it made her feel safer. She'd heard from a friend that her husband's parents had moved to town. That surprised her. I wonder why they didn't tell me. I'm not a stranger. But apparently they had a different opinion on the matter. Kelly looked forward to her husband's return from the army. But after his service, James did not return to the village. He wrote her a letter asking for a divorce. But Kelly didn't want to let go of the man she was going to spend the rest of her life with. She rushed to the city, where with great difficulty she found out the new address of her husband's parents. James didn't even invite her into the apartment. He walked out onto the landing and with a graduated sadness, said to Kelly, you and I have made a big mistake. Good thing this ridiculous marriage hadn't left the aftermath in the form of a couple of kids such a shame. She's never felt it before, James. And when you realize the mistake, he didn't hesitate to tell you when he joined the army. You see, I felt nothing, no affection. That's why you stopped writing to me, isn't it? It seemed to me that you would understand everything without explanations. The girl angrily muttered, as you see, I didn't understand because dumb she ran down the stairs and thought she couldn't go on living. She was already imagining how everyone in the settlement would laugh their grief at her. Kelly, as usual, decided to pour her grief onto the shoulders of her best friend. Lucy stroked her like a child on the head, asking Kelly not to cry. He is not worthy of your tears. You'll find a good guy and you'll be happy with him. She really wanted to believe in her friend's words. And it flooded Lucy's soul day after day. But one day Lucy told Kelly I was leaving. The girl was stunned. Where, you see, I'm so lucky. Some good friends of mine got me a job in the city. They have dorms there. What about me? Lucy friend in surprise, shrugged her shoulders Kelly. You're a big girl, you'll manage on your own. I cannot wipe your tears all my life. This statement insulted Tasia to the core, and she did not even go to see her friend off at the station. Time passed, and one day the news came from the city that James Nance had married Lucy. It took her mother a long time to get over it. That friend of hers has brought you in so cleverly. Lucy soothed and soothed and soothed. And then she stole her husband. That day Kelly decided to take revenge on her abusers. But she didn't know how to do it in a way that would hurt both Lucy and James. That plan turned into a fixed idea. A failed marriage had a negative impact on the young woman's life. Two more times she tried to create a family, but she never succeeded. Therefore, she gave all her undiminished love to her niece Sophia. Sophia was the daughter of her brother, who was serving a long prison sentence in a high-security colony. Sophia's mother led a dissolute lifestyle, for which she was deprived of parental rights. Apparently, bad genetics affected the girl's health. Sophia was sick all the time and was often hospitalized. Kelly was very worried about her niece when she went to the city to study after graduation. But contrary to her worst expectations, the girl changed for the better. After college, she was given a job in this very settlement. But the aunt decided not to interfere with Sonia. She thought it would be better this way. Her niece often called her and came to visit on weekends. One day, Kelly noticed that Sophia's glasses were noticeably rounded, and she jokingly teased her. What's with you, Baccarat? You must be torturing her too much. Sophia blushed thickly. No, Auntie, it's different. I'm going to have a baby soon. Are you getting married? Not yet, but don't think anything bad. We've only been seeing each other for a little while, and it was an accident. It's the first time I've ever heard of babies being an accident. Does he even know? No, auntie. I haven't told him yet. I mean, I was going to tell him, but I found out William married the girl he was seeing before me. I thought it was wrong to ruin someone else's happiness about myself, and I thought of the child that would grow up without a father, and thought Kelly was beyond angry. 
She also wanted to tell her niece that she was following in her parents' footsteps, but she held back. Sophia was having a hard time with her pregnancy. Helia had to move in with her. She wasn't born a month and a half premature. The girl was very weak and slowly gaining weight. When she was three months old, the doctors discovered she had a defect. At that time, Kelly was still working, but had to settle accounts to be able to help her niece. Sophia was also very grateful, and one day told all about her failed love. When she heard the familiar name, her aunt was filled with anger. Again, are we really destined to endure forever from this family? But the woman did not pursue the idea further, thinking that there are many namesakes in the world. Her niece showed her a picture of her with this guy at the fountain. Kelly immediately felt a shiver run through her, and she barely restrained herself from screaming. It was him. He looks just like James and is as mean as his father. How many times had Sanja convinced her aunt that William knew nothing about the baby? Kelly stigmatized his name. He's going to get a boomerang one day. Daddy's gone before his time, and he's going to go the same way. How can you do that? I'm telling you, it wasn't William's fault. And I don't regret having a daughter with the man I love. But the aunt was not satisfied with the situation. The thirst for revenge and listened to her soul. Several times she tried to find out William's address, but then gave up this dubious endeavor because Sophia was seriously ill. She spent most of her time in the hospital under an IV, and the doctors warned her to prepare for the worst, because one day her kidneys would finally fail. Your niece was not allowed to give birth, and the doctors told her that. But she did her own thing, and Hay was not five years old. When she lost her mom, Kelly had immediately filed for guardianship, determined to devote the rest of her life to raising the little girl. Molly felt like her heart was about to jump out of her chest from the bad vibes. She could barely stand on her feet. Nancy hadn't called, which meant she hadn't managed to get money from the father of this unknown Adam. The woman walked up to the third floor of the hospital and imagined what her husband's attending physician would say. But she did not have time to reach the resident because she met Vitaly Semyonovich at the elevator. The doctor smiled at her with a friendly smile. As they say, the ice is broken. Tomorrow we will operate on your husband, and today, after lunch, we will transfer him to the cardiology center. The woman froze in amazement. The doctor saw her confusion as excitement for a loved one. He gave her a friendly pat on the shoulder. Don't worry, you'll be fine. I'm just sure of it. Citing his incredible business, the doctor said goodbye to the woman. She stood in the corridor for a long time trying to understand what had happened. Finally, it dawned on her, God, why am I racking my brains? Nancy must have arranged the whole thing, but she hadn't told me when she was sure she was right. The woman hurried to her husband's room, but another man was already there. The nurse passed by her with a handkerchief uncovered by a napkin and unhappily threw. Woman, are you interfering with work? Molly rushed after the girl. Tell me where is my husband? He was in this room yesterday. The girl on the move muttered. When will it all end? Woman, we don't give information about patients. All information is in Tom's desk. Find out about your husband. Molly, I wanted to cry, and at that moment the nurse, who gave birth on the floor in the corridor, said transferred your husband in cardiology. Half an hour ago, I personally took him on a gurney down to the first floor. And then the guys from the center moved him further up. There his things incomprehensible word unpleasant cut on the ear. But the woman only wrinkled her nose. She thanked the nurse and again headed for the elevator. But the worker decided to supplement the information. You better walk. Our hospital has a covered passage. When you go down to the second floor, walk down the corridor a little bit and there you will see the sign. Thank you very much. Following the nurse's advice, Molly walked along the indicated route and thought how different people are. They seem to have the same farm. And the nurse was so nervous she couldn't say a decent word. She once again mentally thanked the nurse, who calmly explained everything to her. But in cardiology she was disappointed. The same young nurse said Nance is already preparing for surgery, so you won't be able to see him today. Then I'll wait. You can do that here. The girl smiled. Actually, we are scolded if relatives of patients stay here for a long time. 
but I know for myself that waiting under the doors of the operating room. It's the worst of the worst, but there's only so much you can do. Why did you go home and call me this afternoon? Is the surgery really going to take that long? Sometimes our surgeons stay on the operating table for 10 hours or more. That's their job. The girl sighed expressively and smiled again. And in this smile there was so much warmth and kindness that Molly had a little relief from the heart. She walked leisurely along the familiar route to the hospital exit, but was stopped by her daughter's shout. Mommy, wait, Nancy raced down the hallway and into her face. One could guess that she had already managed to run a marathon through the floors. The girl ran up to her mother and out of breath, began to report to her mom. You have no idea what I had to endure today. I rushed to Adams this morning. He made arrangements with my father yesterday. By the way, not everyone is rich and Kathy dad immediately counted out as much as we need. So I took the money from them and I run back to the hospital to pay for the operation and they tell me it's all paid for. I'm standing there like a fool. Mom, was it so hard for you to call me and tell me that you've already taken care of everything? Molly was at a loss for words. Natalia had to make an extra effort to get her mother's ability to speak Nancy back. I thought you were the one who beat me to it. So you didn't pay for anything. No, I called everyone on that list, but I got nothing. However, in the evening I was contacted by Greg and she said that the college staff decided to make a donation, but the necessary amount is unlikely to be collected. I wondered if there was a secret benefactor who had decided to help us. Molly shrugged. I have no idea, but it doesn't matter now. The main thing is that your father will live if the operation goes well. Nancy not without a sneer remarked mom, let's not do that. If I don't like uncertainty in any form, and I'll be sure to find out who that wizard in the blue helicopter is. Why blue? Mom, it's a little song. A wizard in a blue helicopter will come and give us free money. Molly cringed. Nancy, can you spare me your jargon? I can. But I'd look like an alien and no one would understand me. Anyway, Mom, you go home. I'm gonna hang out here for a while. I'll find out. Nancy's reconnaissance mission didn't last long. She burst into the apartment and right in her street shoes passed the trunks into the living room, where her mother was sitting in front of the TV, trying to distract herself from grief. Molly only had time to exclaim, Nancy, you're not at the train station. But the daughter didn't let her say another word. Mom, leave your moralizing to me. Then I got such information that you'll faint and it's not enough to put me in the hospital. You'll go with Thomas then, won't you? Nancy threw off her boots and sat down on the sofa next to her mother. Of course we'll be lost without you, but you're distracting me from the main topic. The girl rolled her eyes and inhaled noisily, continuing the tale of my adventures. Anyway, then I went to the accounting department to find out what and how. And there a lady in glasses looks at me as if I fell from the moon. She says we have no right to disclose confidential data. And I said I have every right to know who paid for my dad's surgery. Imagine, my aunt's mom. From mental effort, and even glasses in her body. Nancy was clearly enjoying her little triumph, and Molly had to cut her daughter some slack. How long are you going to torture me? Let's get to the point. Who is this mysterious sponsor? Nancy grudgingly curled his lips. Mom, it's not even interesting with you. I'm always getting screwed over. But if you can't wait, listen. It was arranged by a certain. I got a tip and I found this woman. She works in neurology and is the daughter-in-law of a woman. Next door with whom my mother now lives, hold on tight. And I almost fainted when I heard the last name Nance. What's that supposed to mean? We have relatives we've never heard of. It's an interesting story, isn't it? Molly waved it away as if invisible flies were swirling around her. Nancy, you've given me such a vegetable garden that I didn't understand anything. Some neighbors unknown relatives. There's not many people in the world with the same personal details. As far as I know, your daddy has no aunts or uncles. He was an only child in his parents' family. Nancy didn't give up. Mom. There are also third cousins. Nancy, stop it. You're giving me a headache. You don't want to go looking for this mystery woman who quietly dropped off almost $200,000 in an envelope. Do I look like an idiot? 
I have to wait for the result of the operation first, and then I can go on a thank you mission to that neighbor. Nancy, without getting up from the couch, pulled on her boots. Mother anxiously asked where are you running around again? We've got to get the money back. Yes, of course. And she'll be sure to thank Daddy Adam. I know without you telling me. By the way, the family has great ancestors. They're both historians. When they were young, they were diggers. Now they write scientific articles. His father tells stories that take your breath away. I should have gone to history school back in the day. Nancy, at your age, it's time to make up your mind. You're acting like a teenager. When I get married, I'll settle down. After Nancy left to go about her business, Molly wanted to call the hospital to find out how the operation went. But no sooner had she gotten to the phone, which had long been bored on the nightstand in the hallway, than the bell rang. The signal was so loud that the woman flinched. She picked up the phone and immediately heard a cheerful female voice. Molly, yes, I'm calling from the hospital. You came in today and we had a little talk. The operation was over and everything went well. The woman realized that she had decided to be happy. The same nurse who had a warm smile. She asked me can I visit my husband today? No, better tomorrow afternoon. He'll be asleep for a long time after the anesthesia. It's better not to disturb him now. A warm wave of peace spread through my body. Molly took the remote control and randomly pressed one of the buttons. At the same moment funny characters from a popular children's cartoon appeared on the screen and sounded so familiar will suddenly arrive wizard in a blue helicopter. The woman threw herself on the back of the sofa and covered her eyes. She thought how good it was that there were still wizards in the world. A bouquet of aromas penetrated through the narrow slit of the poorly closed door to the kitchen. Those matchless smells were filling the pleasant memories. And William asked loudly, so that his wife Molly could hear him. Do you remember the picnic we had at the old farmhouse on our 10th wedding anniversary? The answer was immediate. Of course I remember. Did you and Greg make such a masquerade that the whole village was frightened? You should have thought to degenerate into fur coats and sheepskin coats in the summer. And to walk around the village like that. Molly sat down on the sofa next to her husband. And William smiled at her. Yeah, me and Greg had a little too much to drink. But the local men understood us. I'm the company that came out of the bathhouse. Yeah, they recognized you as one of their own. Cause we had a little too much to drink too. Yeah, one of them even grabbed a stick and yelled, Brothers, the Vikings have come for us. Then they showed them the Vikings and the 300 Spartans. Why do you suddenly remember that picnic? The smells from the kitchen brought back memories. That means you're hungry. That's a good sign. Just bear with me. I'll have everything ready soon. I'll fatten you up. You're getting skinny. The woman went to the kitchen, but came back into the room. William, I want to ask you something. Do you have any relatives living around here? I mean your father's or your mother's family. The man answered immediately no. All the relatives are scattered all over the country. My parents still corresponded with them. And then cell phones came along. And as strange as it sounds, the connection was cut off. The woman quietly dropped, so it's a namesake. Molly, you're speaking in riddles. I must have missed something important while I was in the hospital. Would you be a dear and tell me all your secrets? Molly was about to tell her husband about the strange story of the money for his operation. But at that time, the door of the apartment with a rattle fell off and firing into the hallway. Nancy reported, it seems that I'm in time smells so charming. The mother whispered at her daughter. You know daddy's not supposed to worry. You could have been quieter to announce your arrival. Nancy soon read the guilty look on mom's face. I'll be sure to make it up to you. The girl jumped up. Where did Ivanovich poke her father? On the way. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. Just waiting for an invitation to the table. Mom decided to take me by force. She's making me a tasty hue for the table without calling me. We're gonna rush her now. Let's go to the kitchen. The girl helped my father get up from the couch. Dad leaned on me, but the man took her hand away. No, I need to start getting settled in slowly. You might want to take your time. It's only two days after you've been discharged. Sebastian said that we should gradually get back to normal. Molly looked lovingly at her loved ones. 
It's a pity Thomas isn't here. William asked when he would show up, promised by the weekend Natalia, forgetting his mother's warning, ran in super. Arsony, and I just planned a very important event for this weekend. Of course, I'm not sure that dad should. William interrupted his daughter. It's only Monday. Until Saturday, I mind so much that I'll be running around laying out to my daughter what the event is that our presence is mandatory. Nancy blushed. You don't guess it yourself. The man exclaimed, is it really an engagement? Well, sort of. Kathy and I don't want to make a fuss, but his parents are stubborn. They said it's a tradition that must be honored. You and Arsene will have to be patient. We put up with a lot more than that. By the way, you'll have to be patient too, because Kathy Dad can't live without creativity. He's come up with an unusual format. First, a themed exhibition, but that'll pass quickly, and then a dinner at a restaurant. But everything will be family-friendly, so there will be a chance to relax. Molly happily picked up on it. It will also be a chance to thank Daddy Adam. William was surprised. I'm screwed again. What are you going to thank him for? Mother and daughter, interrupting each other, began to tell how they were looking for money for the operation. They also told of a Jane Doe. Charity William thought for a moment, then said quietly, So I owe my life to a strange woman, and I thought it was Greg who'd done it. He came to see me in the hospital after the operation. He sang such dithyrams in his honor. Molly remarked sadly, Greg discovered me almost immediately, and so did my best friend. So you should consider whether you can trust a partner like that. Nancy, I decided to contribute to the discussion of an important topic. Yes, it's not for nothing that they say friends are friends in trouble. I hate that my blue one is not like that, so I can safely marry him. William said with a chuckle, we've all come to our own conclusions, but it seems to me that Nancy has the most to gain. She has convinced herself of her groom's high moral character. Most of all, on Saturday, Molly was worried. She tried the method recommended by her daughter to stop the trembling in her body. But it didn't help for long. Worry the woman darted from the closet to the large mirror, asking her daughter. Nancy, do you think this dress is appropriate for a social occasion? Wouldn't you rather wear a sequined evening one? The role of counselor was not to the girl's liking, and she answered with undisguised irritation. Mom, what's glitter in broad daylight? Don't bother, you shouldn't. You look very impressive in a cream-colored suit, but it's too austere. Remember, classics are appropriate everywhere. The woman began to try on the suit, wondering, where did you get such knowledge of fashion? Mom, from the Institute, we studied the history of women's costume and men's too. You don't think your daughter is a total dummy? I don't. You're the best kids in the world. It's the first time in my 22 years I've ever heard anyone compliment me. Nancy helped her mother arrange her hair nicely and was pleased with her appearance. It's beautiful. You should go out more often. You're so confined to the apartment. The exhibition of paintings by local artists was held in a gallery that had recently opened at the Museum of History. Although there weren't many visitors, you could feel the excitement of Nancy. Immediately after the modest opening ceremonies, she disappeared somewhere, leaving her parents to enjoy the world of art. William was still very weak, and Molly kept asking him how he was feeling. William, are you all right? Are you feeling dizzy? For a while, the man patiently replied that he felt fine, but then whispered in Molly's ear, Molly, we are at an exhibition, not in a clinic. Okay, I won't do it again. Also whispering, the woman replied, there weren't many works on display, so it didn't take long to get acquainted with them. The Nance spouses were leisurely settling down around the hall. Suddenly Molly squeezed her husband's hand painfully. William is concerned, asked Molly. What's the matter with you, William? There's that woman here. Remember I told you about her, the stranger in black? Yes, yes, the one who came into your room. Only today she's dressed quite nicely. I take it she's my benefactress. I should go over and thank her. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be admiring these masterpieces right now. Molly clutched her husband's hand tighter, and they walked together to the opposite end of the hall, where a decent group of expressionist admirers were crowded together. Involuntarily, Molly listened to the voices and realized that the connoisseurs were discussing the paintings of a young artist named Molly.
She also thought what a rare and beautiful name. While her wife mentally marveled at the name of the unknown artist, William couldn't take his eyes off one of the paintings. The work was called Girl on a Swing and featured an airy network of colors. The canvas depicted the fragile figure of a girl in a white polka dot dress. The artist captured the moment when her heroine took off on a swing to the clouds. A mysterious smile froze on William's face. He whispered, This nymph looks like a girl I used to date when I was young. Jealousy awoke in the woman's heart. You never told me anything about it before. And where is your nymph now? I don't know. We didn't have anything serious. I tried to find her, even wrote her letters. But a relative, Sophia, that was the girl's name, wrote to me to leave her alone because she was married. Well, I didn't bother. Molly didn't listen to her husband. William then tell me about your love. Come on, there's even a woman standing off to the side. See, I see. I think now would be a good time to approach her. Kelly immediately recognized the Nance couple in the audience, but she didn't want to rush things. And there was nothing she could do to change that. After talking to Molly, she decided to be completely resigned to her fate. She said to herself, let it be as it should be, if I deserve to be punished. Let God punish me. And today she didn't want to go to the exhibition, but her family insisted to her aunt, stop sitting at home. You're not a prisoner, but a modern woman, and I'd like you to be near me. After all, my success is the fruit of your labor. And Kathy herself picked out an outfit for her and tidied her hair, aunts. At the very last moment, Arthur volunteered to accompany the women. The young man hinted that a pleasant surprise awaited them after the exhibition. Kelly confidently told me how Arthur was going to propose to you. It's about time, because he's going around and around, around and around, and he can't make up his mind. And Kathy blushed with embarrassment, but didn't say anything. Like all girls her age, she wanted to be happy. She felt that Arthur had been courting her for more than 10 years for a reason. But there was still a fear in her heart that her chosen one would suffer ridicule because he had married a girl with a flaw. And today, his determined attitude really surprised her. If I'm not the one to think, I guess my aunt is right. And I have a chance to be happy. Perhaps the happiness of being loved. It's been bestowed upon me from above for sparing no expense to save a man. I wonder if he knows who helped him. When the loved ones approached Tasia and Makarov, she immediately said I knew that you would find me. But your recovery is not my merit. William felt constrained under the piercing gaze of this woman. But he averted his eyes and asked firmly whose. I want to thank everyone who took part in my rescue. At that moment, Kathy also came up to them. She smiled, and that smile was the answer to all questions. William swayed slightly and the young artist said in an ingratiating voice, I know I look a lot like my mom. You haven't changed a bit. Molly didn't realize what was happening. She looked from one person in the scene to another. Would someone please explain it to me? Kelly said dryly. Yes, I guess it's time to put everything in its place. The daughter had finally found her father. Or did he find her? They lived next to each other for almost a quarter of a century but they met for the first time in their lives. Yes, all sorts of things happen in this life. That's why we shouldn't be surprised. It's been two years. Nance, they decided to celebrate the revival of the country residence. William had warned his wife in advance that he wanted to spend time with his family. Don't you dare invite your Cindy over after everything that's happened. I don't want to look at her. Molly, soothed my spouse, not thinking I'm any more stupid than I am. It'll just be our kids, the matchmakers, and of course, Kelly. That's right. We can't do without her. The woman looked at her husband sternly. You don't talk back to me. You try to hide your holes. Why did you never tell me about mom and hay? William waved his hands in despair. Molly begged her not to start. Again, this was all before I met you. Every man has chance meetings. Do I really have to tell you all this? It's not going to make you feel better. It's going to make you feel worse. So you're saying that you're sparing my ego. What nobility? Molly. I didn't. What was that has already passed and it is not worth it now, when we are about to have grandchildren to muddy the waters. And I'm asking you to be gentle with Molly, to show some mercy. The girl's been through enough. She's not the only one. I've had my share of bitter water. 
Molly, are you jealous of my daughter? Molly put aside the knife she used to draw the onion and cried. William, I don't recognize myself. Yes, after you were born a second time, I'm jealous of you of everyone. And I don't know how to get rid of that jealousy. The man pressed his wife to his chest and began to soothe. Do not get rid of jealousy in moderation, like pepper in a spicy dish, only adds piquancy. But I will now know that after so many years of marriage you love me. There was a clamor from behind, and the couple simultaneously said the children had arrived. Nancy led the procession, followed by Adam, carrying a portable cradle. A little farther along walked Kathy and Arthur, and at the very end of the guest chain was Kelly. Nancy hastily kissed her parents' mom. Dad Thomas would arrive later Kathy's fall. Parents promised to visit your farm next time. Although in fact, there's nothing to show. As it was with Ira, so it is. William objected, if only you had the desire, everything else would come. I've been thinking at my leisure, and I've decided, why don't we make a grand construction project for the whole family? How do you look at it, young people? Nancy answered positively for everyone. It's not a bad idea, and there's a rational grain in it. It's hay, though. Adam reacted instantly to his wife's voice. But Nancy laughed, darling, you're not the only hay in this company. You now have a namesake, my sister. Nancy threw a glance. Where are the parents? Who were given to the two over the Mongols? Then she looked at the picnic arrivals. Guys, it's only now that I realized how really great it is to have a big family. No, honestly, it feels like you're wearing armor. And Kathy hugged her stepsister. I've always dreamed of having a big, close-knit family, too. Nancy patted her on the shoulder. You'll give birth to a guard of boys or girls with Arthur, and then you'll teach them all to paint. Oh, Nancy, I almost forgot. I have a serious matter to attend to. You know about legal matters. No, that's why Adam's so well-versed in the law. What's your problem? Ah, nothing too big. I just want to start some kind of school or art class. I've got the money for it, but I need a good lawyer so I don't get in trouble. William took a break from cooking steaks. Not if it's not your proposal, by the way. Nancy and I have been thinking about a family business for a long time, but we couldn't get our hands on it or our opinions didn't coincide. And now we're in complete agreement on everything. Your idea fits perfectly with the concept of our education center. Kelly sat back and thought, everyone has forgotten about me. No one wants me at this party. But no sooner had she finished that bitter thought than Molly's voice sounded, Aunt Kelly, why are you bored alone? Come here and give me a little help. I'm coming, Molly. The old woman hurried away, whispering to herself, No, there's still a policy on me. Then I'm still needed. 